you are good to go. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, one and all. This is the... I'm getting some... Yes, 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 yes. This is the Board of Directors Legislative Committee meeting of uh, February 24, 2023, East Bay Regional Park District. We are beginning at uh, 1235, just about. And I'm going to ask our committee recording secretary, Flora, to take the role of the committee. Absolutely. Welcome, one and all. Chair Coffey. Present. Director San Wong. Here. Director Waspi. Present. Also present, we have a number of Park District staff who I will name. We have Deputy General Manager, Dr. Anna Alvarez, uh, Assistant General Manager, Dr. Ken Waisaki. We have Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, Eric Feeler, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst, Lisa Baldinger, with us on uh, Zoom as well, we have Jeff Rasmussen. Uh, we have, uh, and I'll recognize board member John Mercurio as well, listening in. We have um, Chief of Planning, Trails and GIS, Brian Holtz present. And our federal advocate, uh, Peter Umhofer and state advocate, Doug Houston. We also have Alex Gonzalez assisting with Prime Gov, Dave Butler from Information Services, and myself, Laura Chantosh, Legislative Assistant. Uh, Chair Coffey, I can also state the ways that members of the public can submit co public comment. Please go ahead and do that. Thank you. You are welcome. The East Bay Regional Park District intends to hold meetings through either an entirely virtual platform or a hybrid of in-person attendance with the Board of Directors designated staff and limited members of the public participating in person at the Park District Headquarters, 2950 Peralta Oaks Court in Oakland, California, and through the Park District's virtual platform, Zoom. Members of the public are strongly encouraged to wear masks inside district facilities. The Park District is providing li live audio and visual streaming. For those members of the public not attending in person, public comments may be submitted one live via Zoom, Two via email sent to myself, fchontosh at ebparks.org, or three via voicemail by calling 510-544-2024, as noted on the agenda. If there are no questions about the meeting procedures, we can begin. Okay, thank you, Flora. We will then take public comment on items on the agenda as we proceed through them after presentations and board comments. And we will arrive at public comment on items not on the agenda just prior to the end of the meeting at item numbers, agenda item number seven. So with that, we'll proceed to item number one, Deputy General Manager's comments, Dr. Alvarez. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, President. Chair Coffey and President Waspi and um, Board Member Swansung. Uh, Deputy General Manager, Dr. Alvarez, and I'm delighted to be here with you in person. Uh, we have a very robust agenda for today's afternoon, for this afternoon. And to begin, I really would like to share with you a little bit of what got us all, all excited this morning as we got up to do one more day of forwarding the mission of the Park District. We woke up to uh, our lands being dusted with a little bit of white powder. So I'm going to share with you a couple of pictures uh, from Tilden Regional Park. Uh, I think we haven't seen snow since 1976. That was the last number that I saw. So this, this happened very early in the morning. This is a Tilden Corporation yard. And Flora, if you don't mind, help. here's another view of the snow that took place this morning. And then we have a video, so you could actually see it snowing. You can see that. It's a very short video. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Dave. Yes, it was. 
This is taken from an icon from field staff reporting between 5.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the morning at Tilden Corporation Yard. I also um, have reports from staff as we were all very excited um, that there was uh, also additional snow that fell in Del Valle uh, Region, uh, State Park. And uh, as staff were conducting their annual assessment of the bald eagles that were nesting. So staff were reporting this morning that they're doing really well. We see an increased number of bald eagles at Del Valle. Del Valle and it was just an amazing experience to see that in the snow. So I wanted to share that little bit of news because it really signals to this continued change of climate. And it's more than weather. This is about experiencing a, new, a cold front that we haven't seen in the Bay Area for decades. And so as we just experienced five atmospheric rivers, and, um, and I wanted to thank you for your advocacy. You will get more of a recap on our state advocacy efforts that took place about two or three weeks ago that we were all, all of you were advocating on the impacts on our lands and how it impacts public access to those lands when we see extreme weather patterns. While the snow is very welcome, we also are, are grappling with millions of dollars of damages. So thank you for your advocacy. We'll learn more about that, yes. Um, Tilden's Park, what did, when did you say it previously snowed? Uh, the number that I got from staff was 1976, to be confirmed, but that's, that's what's being shared. Um, and, and I wanted to share with you that as a member of the state 30 by 30 initiative planning, uh, partnering planning committee, coordinating committee, I am seeing firsthand the energy and the enthusiasm around the regional collaboration in building resiliency of this changing climate. And most importantly, I wanted to share with the board that the state is continuing to invest in these climate smart strategies with $48 billion in the governor's budget as it was released in January of this year. And during that budget announcement, it was noted that the governor um, also referenced a possible resources bond, which we spoke a little bit with our legislators a few weeks ago in Sacramento, to further augment the financial commitment to meeting the goals of uh, the state in preserving 30% of, of threatened lands and 30% of threatened waters. So, and I bring that forward, this is not new to you, but I bring that forward because with greater resources comes a greater responsibility at the regional level. At the regional level is where we, we will be able to have the greatest amount of impact, especially in California. So this is a moment in time where we need to really scale up and we need to really accelerate what we do really well and also start thinking audaciously and other ways of approaching this very big moment in time that may be passing. And with that, I wanted to share that uh, the Eastwood Regional Park District as a regional entity, we are continuing and also beginning new initiatives to advocate for larger allocations to existing grant programs, supporting new ones, and ensuring that any resources bond includes funding, which will advance even further the 30 by 30 pathway strategies in that document that the Park District contributed to. Uh, we will also continue to advocate for uh, very specific projects, but most importantly for funding programs which will support resiliency on a much, much larger scale to uh, be administered through new grant uh, programs. To give you an example, the East Regional Park District operates and manages over eight bodies of natural open space waters that contribute to the watershed of, of, of about 40% of the water quality the water in California. So within those eight huge bodies of water that they need to be restored, they need to be dredged, they need to be maintained so that the um, water quality is maintained and the efficiency of the watershed is pronounced even more or accelerated even more that really speak to quality of life issues, both for wildlife, also for the ecological systems in the natural world, but most importantly, if nothing else, to the uh, 2.9 million people here in the, that, in, that live in the East Bay in the Park District's jurisdiction, never mind the other millions of people that are touched by our waters in some way or another through these watersheds. Um, this is just an example, and, and we're advocating for comparable projects under one heading, which is not new to the Park District. So we're looking at big, large blocks of funding that will help and benefit the state in doing the accelerating the allocation of resources so that we can accelerate that restoration. And this is not new to the district. We've done really well in the past. If you remember Measure FF, 
we had commitments to very specific large uh, um, uh, typologies or categories, like our safe and healthy forest, which really speaks to our responsibility and our number one priority of managing the fuel vegetation management along not only the, the hills, but also the grasslands in those two counties. And this approach will translate at the state level and I will and with your support, with the support of our board, and the Park District leadership and the many people that, that work and advocate on behalf of the Park District, we can certainly lead this effort in accelerating and scaling up our ability to do that restoration work that is so necessary. So I there's more to come and we'll dive into the details, but I wanted to bring that as the opening remarks because today uh, we will continue to speak of the possibility of a resource bond we will continue to speak to our programmatic areas for our 2023 legislative program. And most importantly, I'm inviting you to partake in conversations at future meetings where we're going to be really diving into the, into the details of this strategy. And then with closing, I would like to just give kudos to staff who are diligently working on how to be audacious and think outside the box so that we can advance a very large portfolio of critical needs so thank you to Eric Fuller, Lisa Bollinger, certainly Flora and our general manager, general manager Landreth for the advocacy and certainly um, all of our partners uh, because we see that uh, our partnership strategies is enhancing and we can to do to move this body of work regionally, it really requires more than the park district. It requires those critical partners that we benefited from in the past and new partnerships that we need to accelerate this work. And that concludes my comments, Director Coffey. Um, it's a lot, I know, <laughs> but I just wanted to give a preview uh, to give a little bit of uh, a tone of what the meeting will be today about. Thank you, no, that's very helpful. And I'm pleased to hear that we are uh, watching the uh, uh, various sources of funding we have been uh, benefiting from, from the state government. Uh, over the course of the next year and how that is uh, impacted. We know from Doug's presentation, I think last month, that some of these funds are, are being cut back and uh, it uh, behooves us to stay on top of that and what, what, uh, what's happening with those funding sources that we've uh, benefited so much from for the last two years and expect to this year. Uh, so thank you and thank you for that. And might we, by the end of the weekend, be looking at extending winter rec services toward cross-country and downhill skiing? Ski Tilton, cross-country at Black Diamond? What, what do you think? Not quite. Not quite? <laughs> That's funny. It's not sustainable. <laughs> I just for you know, a few days, we could claim the expansion of recreational services in such a mission. P oh, gosh, yes. I'll grab some skis. We'll go up and go. do it. Four in the morning. Now nah, you can do that. I'll, I'll pass. Uh, it is. It is. I remember as a little kid making my mother drive me all the way to Mount Hamilton because I'd never seen snow. I hadn't been up to the Sierras when I was six years old or seven years old, and I remember her driving me down to Mount Hamilton because it was rare, like today rare opportunity for little kids who had never gone to the mountains to um, see snow. And I'm sure Mount Diablo's got some covers. I mean, so that, that's always fun and beautiful. So let's go to item number two, government and legislative affairs. Is that Eric or Lisa? Both. 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 Apologies. Apologies for that. I'm getting used to using the computer and being in person at the same time. Um, Eric Feeler, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, uh, wanted to begin our presentation today and uh, with uh, with your um, consent, uh, Chair Coffey, uh, we're going to uh, do our presentation from our seats because we're going to, uh, Lisa Baldinger and myself will go back and forth um, and give a little overview of all the meetings that we had in Sacramento and because we were divided. We each have notes from the two different meetings. So uh, as you know, the, the meetings were January 31st through February 1st. Um, and we met with 11 offices 
uh, at the legislature. And then we also met with the governor's office and Department of Finance. And then we had a very pleasant uh, afternoon, mid-morning afternoon uh, with uh, State Park Director um, and the Natural Resources Building. Uh, as as we met with the legislative offices, we focused primarily on the storm damages um, and some of the notions of rebuilding back better. Um, and our great example of that is uh, perhaps if a, if a culvert went out, perhaps we should uh, not replace the culvert, but daylight the creek and put an ADA accessible bridge over the over the over the creek. Um, and then uh, we also touched on our request for green jobs. Um, this California Conservation Corps is seeking to build a facility at Holly Court, Bollinger Canyon, and Las Trampas that would house uh, two field, our fire crews, wildfire crews, our forestry crews, um, that would also be able to help with trail work, and they would also be able to help other agencies throughout the East Bay. Uh, and I believe every uh, office that we raised that uh, was very receptive, so we were hoping that some funding can be added to the budget um, for that facility. And then uh, we also uh, addressed our uh, raising the administrative limit for our general manager, and we have a separate item on that. So we'll talk a little more about that in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I'd hand it over to uh, to Lisa because the first meeting we had was with Assemblymember Lee, uh, and I was not in attendance. So Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa Baldinger, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst. Um, as you can see from, from the photo itself, we had a wonderful meeting with Assemblymember Alex Lee. Um, he brought a lot of energy and enthusiasm in conversation with our issues. Uh, he's to date hosted um, a number of walk and talks and attended events out in our parks. Um, following redistricting, his district has expanded to include Coyote Hills. However, even before that, he was a big supporter of that park, understanding that his constituents went beyond the boundary of his jurisdiction to enjoy our amenities. Um, and so in the meeting with um, Assemblymember Lee, uh, as Eric shared, we touched on our key topics of admin limit, um, where he expressed strong support and did even off offer to author if we still needed an author. Um, we also touched on the need for funding, last funding in at Coyote Hills. Um, subsequent from the meeting, um, we've had some traffic with his office. Uh, there have been three resources bonds introduced at the state level um, to see if there's interest to work collaboratively on that bond measure to really kind of take that enthusiasm he had for partnering with us and channeling it towards creating large grant opportunities for the park district in alignment with the 30 by 30 goals. Um, and then he also confirmed interest in partnering with us on a walk and talk at Ardenwood this year, um, and specifically on a day the train is running. And so we hope board members are able to join us out there, ride the train, um, and meet with the public and the assembly member, um, hopefully in the spring or fall. Uh, next up, uh, we did meet with Assemblymember Bonta's staff, uh, and then we had the, the luck of bumping into her and her legislative director in the hall. Um, in our meeting with Assemblymember uh, Mia Bonta, I really want to credit Director Corbett, who led a number of issues specific to the member's ward. Uh, we provided thanks to the support of our planning colleagues, an update on Alameda Point, an update on the McKay property out at Crown Beach, as well as an update on Martin Luther King Jr. Regional Shoreline. And they were very receptive uh, to staying in partnership with us as those projects advanced. Um, and we also shared with them an update on our administrative funding. Um, and it was followed up with, a, again, an offer an offer to author this funding. And so really a big takeaway from Sacramento was just how many offices were ready to partner with us on our legislative and policy goals. I mean, we ultimately did accept the author um, offer from Assemblymember Bonta's office, and we'll give an update on our administrative limit bill um, following this presentation. So we will be working with them on that legislation this year. Oh, this is another one I was in. Um, all right, meeting with Senator Glazier. Um, he is always just a straightforward individual, really a delight to work with him because he can daylight issues in, in ways that are in no way nuanced, which can be very helpful and productive. Um, in the meeting with Senator Glazier is when we got that first insight into how the Senate redistricting is different than we expected. Um, and so it had been uh, presented to the senators that week um, in a document because those who were newly elected took over their redistricting wards. Those who were not newly elected stayed in their wards, which ended up in a little bit of a puzzle. And so he shared with us that there were some areas where sitting senators took on a new area, and there was a little bit of overlap, which we followed up with Senator Dodd's office a bit more. 
And so we did speak with Senator Glazier about our Martinez Bay Trail project, but that won't be in the district that he um, is elected into. Uh, it'll be in his, uh, wh whoever is elected um, in the next election for that Senate seat. Um, but he gave positive feedback, but really where we gained traction and conversation with Senator Glazier was on the CCC camp. Um, so as our board knows, uh, he has been championing the idea of a uh, training facility akin to the one that we see off of uh, Highway 880, very hard scape ladders um, to be located in the East Bay, possibly on state lands for training formerly incarcerated individuals um, and moving forward uh, opportunities for uh, professional development. Uh, when we shared with him our interest in developing two uh, crew facilities for the California Conservation Corps here in the East Bay to provide a career ladder for green jobs uh, into our fuels crew, park rangers, uh, state park rangers, he was enthusiastic. I um, mean, we had some follow-up traction with his office following the meeting and his commitment to advocate for that budget ask uh, was assured through conversation. All right, I'll pass it over to Eric for this next one. Thank you. Uh, so we had a very pleasant, as usual, meeting with Assembly Member Tim Grayson. Uh, a couple of takeaways there. One was uh, is very interested in uh, the legislation that we were requesting on the administrative limit. Uh, he is working on a similar issue for another uh, government agency in Contra Costa County. So there was receptiveness there. Uh, he also discussed how many bonds are likely to be on the ballot in 2024. Uh, so with regard to the resources bond, uh, he, he was supportive, but was also uh, very aware that there would be a significant amount of competition uh, for the 2024 ballot, November ballot. Um, and then the, the state actually can offer uh, measures uh, in June of 2024. So that might be the possibility for the resources bond. And then most uh, importantly, uh, especially to our chair, is he expressed enthusiasm about um, uh, opening up Marsh Creek State Park and the trail uh, and did agree to come out and, and have a visit. Uh, we have arranged for his staff to uh, have a visit uh, relatively soon. And so we're going to continue to work with that office on both the opening of the park, but also the trail alignment and uh, a member ask in terms of funding to help pay for the uh, for the trail. This is just a group photo, I think. Office of the governor. Oh, yes. The uh, golden bear outside the governor's office, right? Um, we had a, a very interesting meeting. It's the first time we've met with uh, folks from the governor's office while we've been in Sacramento. Um, and uh, they they had a hybrid format where uh, the, the person, I believe, that was the deputy uh, in charge of parks and, and recreation uh, was remote, uh, but very supportive. Um, they did note that the budget uh, asks, uh, in terms of member asks, were being denied without prejudice. They are preparing for... Uh, a bumpy budget cycle, and in doing so, so they are um, starting from a uh, conservative base, and then we'll see how the economy moves forward throughout the year. Uh, they did uh, share an interest in the park district and visiting the parks. Uh, the first partner uh, specifically had an interest uh, they shared, and also um, there was some enthusiasm there about uh, possibly some of the staff uh, visiting some of uh, doing some participating in some of our site visits. And in fact, uh, we did have a couple of representatives from the governor's office at our Hayward Shoreline site visit earlier this year. And so we'll continue to keep them on the list. Uh, and we also uh, are going to be uh, connecting with one of the individuals we met with about uh, accessible playgrounds and, and funding for those types of facilities in parks uh, throughout the state. And that was legislation that was introduced last year. Next slide. We also had the uh, fortunate opportunity to meet with Liz Ortega, our new assembly member from sort of the Hayward, uh, Castro Valley area, and um, very supportive of the park district, very enthusiastic reception. Uh, she uh, is still assembling her staff um, as a new member, uh, but we did have a good chance to connect with her about both the administrative limit legislation that she was supportive of uh, and actually offered to uh, 
author. And as um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, we had a number of offers, so we we had some tough decisions to make there. But we included all of them as as supporters. And then we had a very uh, robust conversation with her about Oyster Bay and some of the development needs there. Um, you know, the former landfill that the park district has owned for about 30 years, we finally have enough fill uh, in place and it's settled enough that we can begin uh, improving the entrance and the um, and some of the amenities to make the park uh, pop alive. So she was very supportive of that uh, and is planning to make a member ask uh, on behalf of the park district for Oyster Bay. And as part of our follow-up, um, with the assembly member, we agreed that we would try to bring her to the site uh, so she could have a firsthand look at um, some of the some of the things that are planned for Oyster Bay. Looks like another one I was in, uh, Senator Wahab, and a uh, great acknowledgement to Director Corbett for um, allowing this meeting to happen and helping to schedule it. Uh, the Senator um, also is uh, developing or, or filling out her staffing. Uh, so she met with us uh, directly, which was great. Um, she did share with us her uh, affection for the Hayward shoreline um, going. She cited that she goes to the shoreline every weekend um, and does, does uh, her daily or weekly hike there. Um, and she would like to do a future walk and talk with the park district at the Hayward shoreline and particularly with interpretive staff. She did, she was very interested in partnering with the park district where the district could present um, issues or had staff that could, could bring to life um, some of the things that we want to highlight. Uh, so that was a very welcome to offer or interest. And she did also mention when we talked to her about the resources bond, she did mention that a lot of the water agencies were also looking at bonds. So again, kind of following that theme that assembly member Grayson presented that, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition in 2024. So uh, good to know that we were uh, up there early this year to, to state our case about the resources bond. And it was also a good sign that it was part of the governor's budget announcement. Um, and she did also share with us that, uh, she her caucus was being told uh, to expect a year year and a half and decline in revenue in terms of state uh, generated funds and so um that was a consistent theme throughout the week that uh, or the two days that uh, revenue may be on on a downward um not moderately downward uh, trend uh, and then we are she introduced us to her district director darius and provided some contact information so we'll be uh, Nar Nargis, I'm sorry, so we'll be reaching out to them to set up a meeting and also to set up that walk and talk. All right. Um, in the afternoon on the second day, we were able to meet with Assembly Member Lori Wilson. Um, and per usual, she brought very warm and supportive energy to the conversation. Um, we had a number of topics. Uh, we shared with her the administrative limit bill. Um, unfortunately, her bills were at capacity. Um, an update on the California Conservation Corps, which she fully supported the green jobs and the career ladder for youth in the East Bay, um, and then provided an update on our need for funding to support expansion of programming into East Contra Costa County. Um, a touch on the fact that the park district, the way our property taxes work, we do accept less or we receive less funding from that area of the district that we want to continue to support and expand in that area. Um, and her uh, district, or excuse me, her chief of, her, her legislative director um, is one that worked on the 2018 uh, Prop 68 park bond. Um, and he's incredibly supportive of parks. And he brought up the potential for um, cannabis tax funding to support programming. Because with a bond measure, you're restricted to sort of one time structural infrastructure funding, but with a, an ongoing funding source, there's that potential for program funding. Um, and so we'll be meeting with our interpretation and recreation team uh, next week, and then setting up a meeting to follow up with Mark, her legislative director, to dive a little bit more into that. And then our hope is to get their whole team out to big break, get them outside. Um, but really, she, she continues to be a supporter, um, and we do expect to host a walk and talk with her at big break later this year. So I'll, I'll speak uh, briefly to our lunch with uh, State Parks Director and Dr. Alvarez, if you have additional comments, um, to be welcomed. He uh, was very generous with his time. Um, and so thank you also, Dr. Alvarez, for arranging that. Uh, he joined us in the lobby, so we got a tour of the, facility, of, of the new resources building. Uh, and then when we got uh, to the upstairs to the State Parks offices, 
uh, he shared with us uh, a couple of things. Um, one was how many grants state parks has over the over the recent year um, has uh, provided to local community parks and and also uh, regional parks, and it was truly a very impressive uh, impressive amount of funding. And so to acknowledge that we we uh, reminded or or uh, complimented the director on his um, staff that that provides grants or or administers the grants because they really are very uh, exceptional to work with. He also mentioned um, some of the work that they're doing to bring art to the parks. Uh, in fact, uh, brought out some artwork for us to to, to look at, which was really, uh, really nice. And um, another interesting um, comment that, that I took away from the meeting is um, obviously there's a new state park for the first time in many years <laughs> um, in the Central Valley. Uh, but one of the key factors in deciding where to locate that new state park was the fact that it would be a groundwater recharge area. And so that was a high priority in terms of making that decision. And it uh, was obviously a very smart um, way of looking at it in terms of the drought. Uh, but I did not, had not known that before our, our meeting, that that was part of the criteria. Uh, he also put us in touch with uh, a staff person that is working on their applications to FEMA for the, the flood damage in state parks and as an agency that manages three of them, um, we will be contacting that person to make sure we're in coordination, uh, particularly out at Del Val um, with the flooding that occurred out there. Uh, and then uh, we will be following up um, with the uh, with the director and the uh, general manager and de deputy general manager for a meeting. And then also, as I mentioned, the follow up on the uh, emergency funds for the flood damage. Well, thank you, Eric. I think the only thing that I would like to add in terms of the, the opportunity to have um, some time, dedicated time with uh, Director Armando Quintero is the example of bringing the humanity to the work that we do. So uh, I hope that you had the opportunity to get to know him personally and understand the breadth and wealth of his expertise in his career from a natural resource perspective, in his body of work with the National Park Services. So he brings to the state parks a very specific vision on climate resiliency. And again, with, which aligns perfectly uh, with the governor's um, take on nature-based solutions. And so um, I hope that you had an opportunity to get to know him personally because he's such a beautiful person. And uh, he brings everything on behalf of the state lands, the public lands that he stewards for not only for today, but for many, many future generations for the long-term sustainability and durability of those lands. And so he wants to continue partnering with us, um, but not to be transactional, but rather to partner with us uh, in, in terms of thinking very, very big at a very much larger scale and being a, a, a contributor to what defines California and continues to define California as a leading state protection of the open space um, and, and access to that open space. So I hope that you enjoyed that moment. Um, we certainly are grateful for the time that he wanted to very intentionally spend with all of you. Thank you. So, and then I'll go ahead and cover Bauer Cahan, Wicks and Dodd and pass it back to Eric to close us out. Um, with assembly member Bauer Cahan's uh, office, we were able to meet with her legislative director. Um, it was shared that they do have a, a very full uh, bill uh, package moving forward this year, so they weren't able to offer to author our legislation, um, but they do continue to be supportive of our interests. Um, and we know that because uh, they've demonstrated their support a number of times with direct state funding for both upgrading our helicopter for wildfire response and mitigation, as well as funding for the McCosker Creek project. Um, for those reasons, uh, we are hoping to present the assembly member with our Rad Key Award uh, during this visit, but unfortunately she wasn't able to attend in person. And so later in this meeting, Flora will give an update on when that event's being rescheduled. However, with the legislative director, we were able to touch on the park district's interest of partnering with their office. Um, by way of reminder, assembly member Bauer Cahan is the chair on the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. And so we have interest in partnering with their office this year through 
um, meeting with them to introduce legislation next year on some form of cutting the green tape, um, whether that's continuing the current SERP exemptions that California Fish and Wildlife are advancing or some other means. And so uh, we have reached out to their office, understandably with bill introduction, it's a very busy time for their legislative staff. And so we hope to set up a meeting mid-summer to begin exploring ideas for the 2024 legislative session um, with our legal and our environmental resources colleagues. Uh, with the assembly member, uh, Buffy Wicks, uh, we met with one of her newer staffers. Um, and so it was a welcomed opportunity to reintroduce the park district to someone um, who's less familiar with us. We also introduced the program of 30 by 30 to this individual um, and really focused on how the park district can support and partner and work together with an office. Um, and so this individual had great enthusiasm for our upcoming April 28th legislative luncheon um, that we mentioned with him and shared sort of a high level support that the assembly member has for the park district. District. However, we would like to connect more directly on a park district project uh, with their office. And so we hope to plan a site visit to Brooks Road later this year. Uh, that was our priority issue for assembly member Buffy Wicks. It's in Tilden. It's a creek that has a sort of a cement overlay that once you're out there, you can see that it needs funding and that we need to restore that ecosystem for the health of the watershed as well as those visiting. Um, and so we do hope to reintroduce that issue to their office later this year. And then lastly, with um, uh, the office of Senator Dodd, we met with his legislative director, Les, um, and we had a fairly high level uh, conversation about issues within the park district. Uh, they did remind us that they have a very small portion of our uh, jurisdiction overlap. However, they continue to be supportive and really active on wildfire legislation. Um, and so we let them know if we could ever be a benefit of participating in a committee hearing in Sacramento or providing a subject matter expert expertise through writing or some other form uh, that we're happy to partner at any time. Uh, then just quickly for the Department of Finance, uh, again, uh, expressed concerns about uh, revenue generation and uh, also with that uh, concerns about any real member asks being fulfilled. Uh, but uh, the positive uh, side of it is that we um, that, that we met with them because we have not historically met with the Department of Finance. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a bonus, one of the staff people we met with, very familiar with the East Bay, grew up uh, with his, in his parents' house with the back of the house on the Iron Horse Trail, uh, very familiar with Tilden. And the amenities there, so a, a real connection uh, between us and a staff person uh, at the Department of Finance. Um, and also, uh, there was a, a pretty good discussion about the Conservation Corps. Uh, the, the, the fire funding is one area where, uh, fire mitigation funding is one area where uh, the governor is, is trying to keep that effort fully funded, along with creating additional uh, resources for the Conservation Corps. Uh, the, one, the one pause is the ongoing cost of um, running the cruise. And so we'll continue to work with um, both the, the governor's office and then um, as Lisa indicated, Senator Glazer and uh, Assemblymember Bauer Kahan in terms of trying to make sure that the Conservation Corps request for Holly Court and Bollinger Canyon um, gets, uh, gets approved. And then uh, he also directed us to Cal OES in terms of the flood damage uh, to work with them on additional funding for uh, some of the things that uh, were, were um, compromised during the floods. And then we, as a follow-up, will be inviting them to come to our uh, site visits um, and hopefully uh, they will be able to join us. And then the last meeting, I think of the whole week or two days, felt like a week, uh, was with Senator Skinner's staff. Um, it was a hallway meeting, so it was a little bit uh, rushed, but we did, we were able, uh, Director Eccles was able to uh, present uh, very, uh, very appropriately about the Conservation Corps issue and the jobs that it could create for young people uh, throughout the East Bay. Uh, and that these skills that, that are learned at the, with the Conservation Corps can translate into jobs both at the Park District and at other agencies that are uh, good paying jobs and provide benefits. So it was a very, very good presentation by Director Eccles. And then uh, Director Corbett uh, mentioned or had, gave a presentation about the Tidewater facilities at uh, Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline in terms of turning a hardscape area that was a storage place for cargo ships, cargo vans, 
uh, into a new park part of the parkland. And so the, the staff person seemed, person seemed very interested and we will be doing follow-up with him. And in fact, did do follow-up with him already because we uh, were able, Director Eccles was able to join a uh, California Special District Association meeting with the same staffer about a week later and reiterated uh, both of the points on Conservation Corps and the Tidewater facilities. So uh, with that, um, thank you, all three of you who are in attendance. We really appreciated that. And I think it was a very effective uh, two days. And um, I think we were all a little bit ready for some rest afterwards, but um, I think we really did. And, and we are actually seeing uh, the fruits of some of the work uh, in terms of, of responses that we've received since uh, our visits. And um, I know it's keeping all of government affairs team uh, very busy right now. So uh, thank you for the good, uh, good two days. And if there's any questions or additional comments from the board, we'd be happy to entertain that at this time. I really enjoyed the opportunity to be a part of this. So thank you so much for organizing it. And it was really helpful to hear this summary of everything that we did because we really did do a lot. It did feel like a full week and not two days. Um, and it's really nice to hear that there's already been follow-up since we were there and that we're seeing a lot of um, positive momentum in regards to this important work. Um, I think I, I just want to, kind of follow up on a point um, from, you know, Dr. Alvarez's opening remarks and then also um, the overview of the meeting with our um, state parks director, Quintero. I, you know, I, I really did appreciate that opportunity to be able to meet him and to tour the new um, Department of Natural Resources building. And, you know, after our um, time in Sacramento, I did do some research into his background. And in addition to his work with national parks and land management, I did notice that he had served as an elected board of director for the Marin Municipal Water District and also was on the California Water Commission. And I think, you know, when we're talking about bonds, you know, I think about Proposition 68 and Proposition 1 from 2014. And Proposition 1 from 2014 was really a more focused bond for water, and yet there was a recreation component in it. Um, I'm thinking about a project such as Los Vaqueros. The initial plan for Los Vaqueros was rejected because it did not include the uh, necessary recreation components. And then thinking about Proposition 68 and groundwater recharge, I can share that um, Zone 7 Water Agency did receive grant funding from Proposition 68 for groundwater recharge specifically. And so I think, you know, looking forward um, at a resources bond and that potential, I think that there is this overlap between, you know, parks, uh, natural resources, land management, and water resources and groundwater recharge. So I think this is a very timely conversation we're having today, and I want to share that. Uh, yeah, well, first off, I, I, thanks. I think it was an incredibly productive couple of days, and and I, I really enjoy the, the ability to meet with these folks. Um, uh, I think it was great. I, I, first off, I'd like to thank Doug Houston and his staff for providing all the hospitality and, and a lot of coordination. We were able to meet in his offices. I truly appreciate that, and I like the way Doug can get us into places and 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 through things and, and, and that uh, um, how should I describe Sacramento? Um, that, that great place up there. Uh, I, but I appreciate Doug's uh, uh, willingness to work with us and, and wind us through that that maze up there. Um, I think it was, you know, things that are unseen and unheard. I think it was a great team building effort. I mean, that was all of our board members together. We rarely get together in a position like that. I mean, pizza night, in my opinion, was just as valuable and effective as everything else because we got to know people we got to see people interacting outside of this this type of venue uh really enjoyed it um i do, i came away with a couple of things and I, I think one of the most valuable things that we have to offer um in a wide variety of, of areas is that ccc program and, and the fact that we can do that and, and it seemed like well it, it seemed like to say we don't have any money this year and it's it's you know it kind of put a damper on it i even uh senator glazer referred to his efforts uh in trying to do 
uh, these training facilities for formerly incarcerated people. And I was thinking just, just off the top, if you guys want to research it, or maybe it would be an, a link that could make it more appealing to people, was I was thinking that the uh, CAL FIRE and, and the California Department of Corrections team up together to have crews uh, that fight wildfire. While people are in prison, they get to get out, they get to fight fires, they're 15 member crews, they drive around in, in vehicles just like our uh, fire crews, our, our, our fuels crews. Um, and I can't help but think if we all, maybe to make it more appealing uh, to some of these legislators, if we said we're going to build this facility and included a camp, because they all have camps, um, uh, it's in the one around here is the Delta crew, and it's a fire crew. They live together, they work together, they fight fire together, and they are, in fact, prisoners. So is, you know, a, a logical step up for me was if we included a CDC camp at Las Trampas, and then along with a, I said CDC, the, the and Cal Fire crew, along with the CCC group, it would be, that seems to be a logical progression for me. And I hate to be crass or using the wrong words, but you're a prisoner, you're learning how to fight fires. And as everybody says, you get out, you've got these skills, but everybody goes, eh, you're a prisoner, we don't want you. But what about a pathway through CDC, uh, Cal Fire, Cal Fire prisoner crew working, uh, seeing how the CCC crew works, which would be a, let's get out of prison, let's go to the CCC, get more skills, and then work your way right into the regional park district. It would seem like a really nice flow to me. And I don't know if that, that would make it more appealing, but I'd sure like to give it a try. Thank you. I use some time uh, at public comment during one of our board meetings to um, mention how well I thought Sacramento went and the highlight for me was meeting uh, with uh, the state parks director and his deputy and having some quality meet in minutes with both that was that was just excellent uh, an excellent opportunity so um, I'll just echo my colleagues it was very well done and planned can we move on to are we at local issues? Uh, well, we have one more uh, short presentation on um, the administrative limit. Yeah, because you, you touched on it and the sponsorships, so. Okay. Uh, but uh, I did want to acknowledge in terms of the Sacramento meetings um, that the, the scheduling work by both Flora and, and Yuli uh, to get us the, the meetings with the electeds and also with uh, arranging for the finance and governor's meetings. And, um, Dr. Alvarez with the resources with the state parks director, but the resources to her um, Flora was was very helpful in arranging that. So just wanted to acknowledge that before we moved on. Okay, and keep us updated on its progress. Local issues, action, actions taken by other jurisdictions, agenda item number three, Brian Holt. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm uh, Brian Holt. Um, Chief of Planning Trails and GIS. I'm going to open up a presentation here real quick um, and share my screen. Um, just, uh, I know I have uh, uh, provided um, this sort of uh, preamble uh, previously, but I will just again, just to, to uh, uh, for the benefit of anybody who's who's new to this meeting, including our new um, assistant general manager, Dr. Ken Waisaki. Um, part of the um, function of the planning trails and GIS department is monitoring um, the actions of local jurisdictions. And those are projects that are of interest to the park district um, that are, um, are uh, around our parks that maybe impact our parks or could maybe benefit our parks um, and just keeping track of those um, and reporting to the board, um, engaging um, with the local jurisdictions as necessary, whether that's through the CEQA process or through just the local land use process um, and uh, and basically working to um, to implement uh, our um, our master plan. So uh, so what we're here today is to report on just some of the actions that um, have come up since we've met recently. So I will go through these fairly quickly. Um, we've already had a a lot of information today, so um, but I'm I'm here and available for any questions as well. So, <clears throat> first item is uh, really a couple of um, 
uh, okay. A uh, couple of projects in the uh, the city of Richmond uh, near uh, Miller Knox Regional Shoreline. Uh, the first project is on a property that um, is referred to as the the former PG&E site. Uh, it's off of Brickyard Brickyard Cove Road, um, and is proposed for uh, I think uh, fifteen townhomes or so um, located uh, between two existing developments. But the rear of the property basically backs up to um, to Miller Knox and to the Ridgeline area there. So. We've been monitoring this. We have met with the developers. Um, there was some interest initially um, from the city about trying to provide a connection from this project into our park. Um, we uh, we advised against that as um, as we generally don't like to have sort of uh, backyard entrances into our parks. They become a, a bit of a, a maintenance and operational uh, challenge. Um, so this project is moving forward with an emphasis on making some trail improvements along uh, along the Bay Trail, along Brickyard Cove Road. So uh, this project continues to move through the design review process um, and we'll continue to monitor it. Here's a, a quick rendering of the project um, with um, with the, the ridge, ridge line of Miller Knox in the background. Um, the other item that um, I just quickly grabbed a screenshot because I realized that it wasn't necessarily a new packet, but I um, wanted to give you an update on is uh, the Terminal One project. So that is um, that is the property that um, is uh, right on the waterfront there. You can see a large wharf um, adjacent to Miller Knox. This is a project that we have uh, engaged on for, for many years. Uh, this property is owned by the city of Richmond. Um, they had uh, an exclusive negotiating agreement with uh, with the developer to develop some, and I want to say 250, 300 or so homes on the property. Um, we had worked with them about looking at some uh, some Bay Trail improvements. Um, there was some some uh, uh, improvements that they were proposing to do with our, our parkland, um, and you could just imagine uh, adjacent to our park that we had a lot of interest there. Um, the city council, the city of Richmond, uh, recently voted uh, to not uh, extend or to not continue with that um, exclusive uh, negotiation agreement um, and basically let the developer go. So the city, um, this is city owned property. Um, there were some suggestions during the meeting that this property might be of interest to the park district. Um, and I would, uh, if that conversation continues, um, we would be uh, very uh, interested in understanding just what the conditions of the property are, particularly from a, a contamination point of view. So there's, um, it can be a, a problematic piece of property, I think, and it has some history there that we would want to be aware of before, um, before any suggestion that Park District owns. Uh, moving forward, um, the community of Knightson uh, move forward with a resolution requesting that the um, Contra Costa County LAFCO, the Local Agency Formation Commission, uh, move forward with uh, dissolving the Knightson Town Community Services District. So um, the town of Knightson, the community of Knightson is an uh, unincorporated community within Contra Costa County. Uh, for years, they have assessed uh, their residents, um, relatively uh, a small assessment, but for, uh, for stormwater management. Um, the uh, the, the current board of the community services district has um, rescinded uh, that um, that assessment uh, and, and has declined to continue to pay for stormwater management within that community and um, and are now moving forward with uh, with actively dissolving uh, the community services district. So we continue to monitor this one because our uh, none property um, is located within the community of Knightson. And uh, as you're aware, we're working in partnership with the Contra Costa County uh, Habitat Conservancy um, on a restoration project on that site. Um, in part to accept and receive um, stormwater um, that would potentially alleviate and address some, um, some problems with flooding in the community. Um, there have been suggestions that uh, flooding is not a problem uh, in this community, but as we've seen during uh, the recent atmospheric rivers, um, it very much is so. Um, so, uh, so we continue to monitor this and, and to sort of see how um, floodwaters will continue to be handled uh, in the future and, and what the uh, impact or, or opportunities for the park district. Um, just real quick, uh, this is just an informational item on uh, the Quarry Lakes Parkway. 
Um, this is a, a new roadway project that is proposed essentially between um, uh, Coyote Hills and, uh, and Quarry Lakes. Um, this is a project that we have actually uh, submitted um, letters of support on for grant funding opportunities. Um, it's, uh, it's something that um, would uh, uh, is being led by the by Union City uh, and the city of Fremont. Um, uh, this in the past has been known as a Highway 84 bypass project um, and uh, something that we're interested in as it would potentially advance some multimodal um, active uh, transportation opportunities through this community um, and provide some new um, uh, some new connections to Quarry Lakes and, and possibly into uh, Coyote Hills as well. So we continue to monitor this project. But this item is just an informational update uh, as the City of Union City continues to move forward on this. And lastly, down on the Hayward shoreline, East Bay Discharge Authority um, has issued a notice of availability for their um, draft environmental impact report for a uh, brine discharge project that would essentially um, take brine from the Cargill facility um, in the city of Newark um, and put a pipeline um, up to the Hayward shoreline to connect to the outfall pipe for the East Bay Discharge Authority. Um, and we have been interested in this because the pipeline uh, one of the alternatives uh, is actually proposed to go through the Hayward shoreline. So, um, so we uh, we provided comments on that. It looks like that alternative may not be pursued. So, um, so, uh, so hopefully it won't necessarily be a concern for us. But we continue to watch and and work with the East Bay uh, Discharge Authority um, as they evaluate their project. Um, so, uh, so just real quickly, um, and then uh, it's. I was hoping it was on here, but I guess it's not. Um, uh, was it just, uh, I got a, got a note that, uh, Director Coffey, that you had an interest in, um, the recent action regarding the FREA project, um, in the city of Pittsburgh. So, uh, the, the, um, as you're aware, the city of Pittsburgh, um, uh, approved a 700 or so home, uh, or, or I think even more, uh, a project in the hills of Pittsburgh adjacent to Thurgood Marshall Regional Park. Um, that was something that um, that we had engaged in previously. Um, uh, the city of Pittsburgh approved the project. Save Mount Diablo uh, challenged the project. Um, a judge um, ultimately ruled that, uh, that some additional CEQA analysis was necessary. Um, the city of Pittsburgh and the project developer, uh, Discovery Homes, uh, did that additional analysis recirculated in EIR. Um, that project went to the City of Pittsburgh uh, Planning Commission two weeks ago, I think. Um, and the City of Pittsburgh Planning Commission voted, I believe, four to one uh, to not recommend approval of the project. So um, that's just a Planning Commission recommendation. The project will go forward to the City Council sometime in March. Um, and we will continue to monitor to see what the, what the uh, Pittsburgh City Council action would be on that project. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on any of these projects or anything else that's going on in East Bay. Sounds pretty clear cut. Could you, uh, I wasn't able to attend and I should just catch up by a, a video uh, of the uh, planning Pittsburgh Planning Commission's consideration of Perea. Uh, I believe Devin uh, attended uh, to to listen in. Was there some theme of objection from the commissioners who voted against uh, recommending approval? Yeah, uh, correct. Devin Reef, our, our principal planner, did did attend the meeting, uh, did listen in, and and he shared some notes on that. Um, I would say uh, just off the top of my head, in terms of what the themes were, um, was generally um, not necessarily in opposition to to residential housing or anything else on the project, but just more of a concern for um, for the hillsides and for the ridge lines and perhaps looking for a project that um, is maybe smaller in footprint or more consolidated or just uh, in some way um, preserving those those ridge lines and that um, and the, those hilltops um, it also uh, there was a number of comments about um, our project Thurgood Marshall Regional Park uh, and ensuring that the city of Pittsburgh has access to that park um, so that uh, seemed to come up uh, regularly okay thank you that's a significant switch from the prior version of the project, which got a three to vote, three to two favorable vote out of that planning commission. So to four to one unfavorable uh, suggests there may be some new dynamics going on there. 
um, which is interesting. And uh, keep us up on that. Will do. Thank you, Director. Go ahead. Um, one question about the Cargill um, sea salts. I know my predecessor, Director Wies Camp, had mentioned something about this company near Coyote Hills and habitat restoration. Uh, it might be a different property than the one you showed. Um, is that correct? I guess that's my question. That 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 is correct. Um, it is a different property than the one we showed. But uh, Cargill is a large landowner in the East Bay, um, and uh, there are some properties uh, adjacent to Coyote Hills um, that are owned by uh, Cargill that the Park District has had a longstanding interest in, um, and certainly that's something that we're continuing to keep an eye on, on as this project moves forward or any other opportunities to engage with Cargill on, on those types of opportunities. Okay, great. And I'd be happy to share with you another time a map or, or more details. Yes, at some it. point I would like to look at that. And then my, my next question is, um, you know, the, I guess in terms of some potential things that might be bubbling up, there's been some conversation um, along the Alameda County portion of the Iron Horse Trail. And I've, I've done some of my own research into that, but I think, uh, you know, I'm kind of at a point where I would like to meet with someone uh, at the park district just to get a little bit more understanding about that part of the Iron Horse Trail. Um, so I don't know if you're the right person or if you can point me to the right person to uh, maybe set up some time to correspond. I'd be happy to set that up. It, it would be probably myself and, and Sean Dugan, our, okay, our trail perfect. program manager, yes. Because I think it's more at the local level in terms of these uh, questions that are bubbling up. Sure, okay. happy, happy to set that up for you. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank Brian. you very much. Have a great weekend. This continues to be a great addition to the agenda of these meetings. Thank you. Appreciate it. Item four, funding and grants update. So Good Jeff? afternoon. I'm Assistant Finance Officer Jeff Rasmussen filling in here for uh, Grants Manager uh, Katie Hornbeck. And I will uh, attempt to share my screen to give you a share our presentation or list rather. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so um, the first project uh, first is a grant that we applied for recently. This is for uh, Brook Road uh, Creek Restoration in Tilden to the National Culver Rural and Restoration Program. It's a four hundred thousand uh, dollar grant request. Um, this grant request, though, is only for the, the culvert and creek restoration portion of the project. There is another public access, ADA access, picnicking part of this project that that uh, this grant will will not cover. But this will this will help fund, but if we get it, the uh, the restoration portion. Then three recently awarded uh, grants since the last time we uh, we met was we did receive three hundred thousand dollars for the uh, for the Finley Finley Ranch uh, Road acquisition project. See, there's a misspelling there. Um, Three hundred thousand dollars is maybe not a lot in the context of this of this important acquisition, but I will comment that um, uh, the Habitat Conservation Fund is one of the longest and most consistent, best standing uh, uh, grant programs with state parks. Um, it's nearly as old as land and water, and they have it every year. And although it's not a lot, we usually we're successful in many many years of getting at least some money out of habitat conservation. So it's good to see that we we're awarded a, a grant again for that and for an acquisition. So that's great. And then um, almost at the same time, coincident two diff different grant programs for the San Francisco Bay Trail project in Martinez. And uh, the first is Recreational Trails Program. These are federal funds administered by the California Department of Parks and Recreation. And it's been a really great project for us. It's one of the few programs that funds uh, you know, a natural service. This is, this is a paved trail, but uh, this program also serves natural service trails. So it's great for recreational projects. And then the next one, the um, Safe Streets for All, SS4A. This is an interesting grant, in fact, that we applied for active transportation funds uh, for this project. Uh, and, when, and when applying to the Contra Costa, Contra Costa County Transportation Authority, they looked at our request and said, you know, that's great, you're applying for active transportation, but we think it actually would fit better. And we'd like to put you into this program. So working with the CCTA, they were able to give us $925,000. So in a really short time here, we got two uh, huge uh, grant awards for um, for the San Francisco Bay Trail in Martinez. And so with that, I will sh stop sharing and take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Good news, as always. Director Waspin, anything? No, just Very happy with your presentation. Yep. Uh, it's unanimous. We're very happy you're getting these. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff.
Uh, item number five, advocacy briefings. A federal advocacy briefing. Is that uh, Eric? Are you going to introduce it or go right to Peter? You can just uh, go right to Peter, I believe. Hello, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, board members. It's great to see everyone again. Just give a brief update on uh, the president's recent remarks to Congress on the federal budget, on community project funding and federal funding, and uh, briefly talk about uh, board member John Macario's recent visit to Washington and some meetings with some of our congressional delegation. First off, on February 7th, many of you may have tuned in to watch the president's address to Congress. This is a beginning of the year tradition that happens at the same time the U.S. federal budget is entered, it usually is submitted by the president to the Congress, and that kicks off the federal funding uh, process, meaning Congress then considers the budget that the president has given him. There's a series of hearings and committees. They craft a bill, and um, there are amendments made to those bills, and then ultimately in the summer, uh, those bills are passed by the House and the Senate and are um, moved then to be signed by the president as separate bills or as one big bill, sometimes referred to as an omnibus appropriations bill. So just by way of background, the season has started and um, working with the government relations and government affairs team uh, to submit requests. Some of those requests we've already talked about in the previous meetings individual requests with certain members on certain things. So i um, happy to get into more detail. Overall, the president talked about wildfires and record flooding and, and in his speech referring to, I visited devastating aftermaths uh, and record floods and droughts and storms from Arizona to New Mexico, all the way up to the Canadian border. More timber is burned than observed from helicopters in the entire state of Missouri. He went on to talk about, you know, climate change and grid and charging stations and clean energy funding and new jobs. And you may have picked up on that. He gave a nod to historic conservation efforts um, as being responsible stewards of our land. Um, I think you will see more emphasis by the uh, administration when it comes to commitments to meeting their their goals of. Uh, conserving 30% lands and waters by 2030. Um, so the challenge for the president is, is that, at least in the court of public opinion, the string of legislative accomplishments the president has had for the last couple of years is um, not, the public's not aware of those successes um, and is, you know, it is not showing up in approval ratings. So, um, this was an opportunity for the president to tout some of those accomplishments over the last couple of years. Also a nod to the kinds of things that he'll be talking about this year and next year. The uh, recent polls had the president up in November, then down in February, and now back up again today. So um, I think you should take it with a grain of salt as these poll numbers, but they've gone from 52 to 37, back up to 49 in terms of approval ratings. All to say that um, I think you will see the Interior Department and the Department of Agriculture and the Forest Service continue to play a bigger and bigger role in more and more announcements coming on addressing the climate change challenge and balancing um, needs for conservation along with uh, renewable energy across the country. So I'll mention a few other items and that is the President's budget is coming out. Um, uh, proposed budget is coming out on March 9th. Um, there are already hearings starting in the Congress on funding. Um, also in that June and July timeframe, as I'd mentioned before, the federal debt limit increase needs to occur. So you've seen some kind of weekly news about that. I think you will continue to see um, more and more attention being paid to that um, as the president um, continues to engage with Congress on to on raising the debt ceiling, which has been done in the past, um, but there's been some some threats that have been made. So um, hopefully cooler heads will prevail. A few other items on 
community project funding, we obviously had some success last year with some members of our delegation and super appreciative of everybody's work to make those happen. Um, the House of Representatives has not decided exactly how they're going to structure um, and what accounts are going to be available for that. Uh, but in the Senate, that process is already beginning. So we're working and crafting those requests um, and submitting those to Senators Feinstein and Senator Padilla. Um, we're also working with other members in the House, though, um, to get ready for when those accounts are officially announced. Um, lastly, I'll just mention um, Board Member John Mercurio was in Washington for other meetings. Um, and so we had a chance to do some meetings on February 13th with uh, Representative Garamendi staff and Representative DeSalme staff. Um, he did an excellent job of presenting the issues uh, to the offices and his experience of working on trails um, really came through in, in these meetings with staff. And I can tell that um, they're excited to, to work with the park district and, and work, with, um, work with him. So in short, Representative Garamendi staff highlighted FEMA assistance for firefighter grants program as a potential opportunity for the park district. Um, the staff um, asked about where the park district was in applying for land and water conservation fund grants. And so we've circled back to them on that. Um, they wanna be helpful on the funding request for the Martinez Trail. And um, they also, the Representative Garamendi serves on the Armed Services Committee and said that there's ever an issue related to military cleanups at bases. Um, we're on the key subcommittee that oversees that, and so we're happy to help at any time. On Representative DeSalme's staff, um, John had worked previously with Sarah on, on, on the, in the office um, on other issues, and so um, it was a good, good discussion. We talked about um, Port Chicago, um, and as you know, um, I guess it was last Friday that uh, Representative DeSalme reintroduced is Port Chicago exoneration resolution. We also thank um, the office for their help in securing the funding last year for the um, historic restoration uh, and visitor center. So um, they also were very interested in assisting with the funding for the Marsh Creek Trail um, request. And so um, we'll be in touch with them uh, on those details. Lastly, Representative Tana's uh, office was kind enough to share some time with us. We talked about some uh, legislation related to grasslands and wildfire threats and making a connection with a Senate uh, sponsor of a really, really excellent bill as it relates to uh, grasslands and, and wildfire. Special districts are eligible for funding under that bill. Um, and so we're hoping that Representative Kana can be the lead sponsor of that bill in the House. Um, there also, there already is a sponsor in the Senate of, of that bill. I'll stop there and answer any questions or turn it back over. Thank you, Peter. Any questions from the committee? I'm not seeing any, Peter. So if you wanna keep plowing uh, ahead. I think that was the end of his report. I'm sorry? I believe that was the end of his report. That was it, Peter? Okay. Thank you. No um, questions. Eric, do you want to comment or move uh, forward? My main, my main comment would be uh, that the, the most important thing that we did with regard to Washington, D.C. is find a date. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we know we're... We're heading there the 22nd of May through the 26th. We're already working. We had our first pre-meet amongst our, our staff. Um, so we're already working to set up that agenda in those meetings. Got it. And I guess, I guess just to, to mention uh, the obvious, Senator Feinstein is retiring uh, at the end of her term. Um, so there will be some musical chairs uh, amongst uh, members of Congress and and that'll also have an impact on the state legislature as well. So stay tuned and it should be an interesting, interesting year. Thank you. 
might have a little impact on the East Bay, as a matter of fact. <laughs> okay, very well. All right. So are we ready to move to uh, Doug and state advocacy? Yes. All right, Doug. Thank very you. Very good. Peter, yeah. Ken, thank you. Yes. Thanks, Director Coffey and board members. Good afternoon, all. Doug Houston. Um, so not much has changed since we last spoke in January. Really, there really hasn't been any miraculous infusion of new funds into this state system to write our fiscal shit. So um, some of my comments might be a little redundant. A quick snapshot of where we are right now in the biennial session is February 17th, Mark the, the last day for bill introductions. As is always the case, uh, about 75% of the bills that were introduced in the first year were introduced the last week of the deadline. So I'm still sort of digging out from about 2,600 bills and reviewing those and analyzing them to determine uh, what their impacts are to you. Um, one of the curious findings coming out of the introduction session was that nearly about a third of the bills were introduced in what's called spot form, meaning that um, they lack content and they're basically placeholders. So the question is, why? I mean, this was really an unusually high number of bills. And I think uh, the takeaway is this sort of a phenomenon that's attributed to the, the vast number of new uh, members, freshmen, and some of the unfamiliarity associated with the process. But uh, the bottom line is, um, I think these bills could represent what are Trojan horses and that, uh, that a lot of them might require uh, further action by this committee when they are uh, fleshed out. So as I mentioned last month and as a refresher regarding the uh, January 10th release of the budget, it, it really underscores a no finer example of sort of this fruitless exchange the state engages in when trying to project um, revenues going forward. As we recall, probably about six, eight months ago, we had a $50 billion surplus, but you know, soon after the governor signed the budget last late last January, um, revenues started to creep uh, downward. And in November, late November, the LAO's office had projected a $25 billion deficit. Um, the governor's release of the budget was a little bit more uh, modest in its projection of the deficit, suggesting uh, 22.4 billion instead of 25. However, more recently, I just read a um, monthly cash flow report from the Department of Finance, suggesting that uh, the budget is tracking more closely the LAO's numbers and that we are about three, nearly three and a half billion dollars off of revenue projections. But the most alarming thing associated with this is that revenue receipt underperformance is accelerating. Um, you know, uh, back in December, we were about a billion off. More recently in January, it was over $2 billion um, just for the month of January alone. So hopefully this trend reverses itself, but uh, we might be bracing for some pretty tough times going forward. Uh, again, important to this committee is that the, ba the balancing of the budget, the governor is calling for some reductions in spending pursuant to his very um, ambitious and historic climate package to the tune of about $6 billion. But uh, a lot of those cuts are more specific to energy and transportation. However, there is some exposure to the climate and resources side of the budget. And again, not to be redundant, but uh, included over the course of the next year, three years, what were proposed to be spent and what are now proposed to be reduced is about almost nearly $500 million from the State Coastal Conservancy, nearly $200 million from the Wildlife Conservation Board, um, money from, for trails that was allocated, money for the active transportation program. But again, Unless revenues trend otherwise, there is a little bit of reason for optimism. We have what are called trigger restoration um, programs in, contained in the budget, wherein come January, if, if revenues, or I'm sorry, in December, if revenues are better than projected, then some of these cuts, proposed cuts, would be restored. And again, as a reminder, the state, we're sitting on about 
30 plus billion dollars in reserves and this budget was balanced without using any of these reserves. Um, as has been mentioned during the course of today's remarks, um, governor trying to placate lawmakers, stakeholders alike, um, and to retain and, and move forward on his commitment to climate um, proposed in his comments during the budget briefing, a bond. So I think while at first blush, um, this, this announcement of the bond is, has a lot of hope and promise, there's sort of this equal and competing challenge, competing challenge facing the legislators in moving forward and in pursuing a goal of a bond. And that is, should the lawmakers, should the administration and legislative budget staff, the framers, the implementers of the, of the budget be content with the bond as a backup plan or fight to retain some of the funding given the fact that we do have the surplus. And um, I think that's, that's gonna be the operational dynamic at work during the budget deliberations this year, because as we've discussed, the mechanics of the bond, while a bond is a very viable funding mechanism for investments in resource-related um, programs and projects, um, such a vehicle really wouldn't call for the release of any bond proceeds in probably not less than two to three years. So we're, we'd be in limbo in terms of the lack of funding in the interim, which could further exacerbate um, investments in climate space or forest health, sea level rise, water resiliency. On the assembly side, um, Eduardo Garcia, familiar name to all of you, has, along with a host of his colleagues, jointly authoring um, a bill, AB 1567. And it has, it's a $15 billion bond that contains categorical dollars for billions of dollars in fire prevention, forest health, coastal protection, uh, fish and wildlife protections, and climate resiliency. Um, in, in working as an extension of Mr. Garcia's staff uh, and your government relations team, as was the case during Prop 68, um, thus far we've worked with Mr. Garcia to secure language that includes a, a per capita element, which would yield a, a multi-billion dollar block grant to East Bay Regional Park District for discretionary spending. It's got some language that calls for investments in regional park district fire mitigation and environmentally sensitive um, vegetation management type projects. Has funding again for trails included and funding importantly for park equity projects through what's called the statewide park program. We've uh, managed to secure some language in the bond that allows for more re relaxed uh, eligibility criteria by increasing sort of threshold numbers for medium household incomes, which will be very, very helpful for the park district as it really hasn't been able to compete for these dollars just because of entry level criteria and the fact that you know, most of the, the Bay Area is relatively affluent. So um, there's also significant funding uh, for the WCB, State Coast Conservancy, a lot of this is consistent with 30 by 30 program and, their, and its objectives. And then we've got about $200 million in there for the, uh, the Bay Area program. And I'm also um, working with, with uh, Eric and Lisa on some language to submit soon regarding um, a residential camp, the, seat, the core residential camp. Uh, in the Senate, um, SB 867 has been introduced by Senator Ben Allen and a number of his colleagues. It's not fleshed out. It's very, it's in skeletal form and it's got a lot of thematic priorities, including drought, fire coastal resilience, park creation access, but there isn't any money assigned to any of the priorities. And there is a, um, the third bond by Senator Eggman, SB 638, which is more flood and water resilience facing. Um, in my conversations with these offices, the administration, um, the governor's office and uh, natural resources hasn't waded into these conversations quite yet. Um, and I think they probably won't till the latter part of this year. 
um, as we've got to just get through this budget cycle. So the biggest question facing all of us are, that are participating in this bond exercise is how much will it be at the end of the day? How to best apportion these funds? Um, and then when to place it before the voters, um, be it March. And this year we are, I believe next year, we're gonna be a March and not a June election or November. There's, there's advantages to both dates and, and disadvantages. So um, more to come. Okay, thank you, Doug. My pleasure. Uh, news, <laughs> necessarily all good. <laughs> but hopeful. And I want with that to turn it over to the committee. Questions of Doug? No? Sounds like a bumpy ride. Any follow up uh, comments from Eric? No, I um, just thank, thanks for the update. And um, I guess the one follow up is that we've, uh, as we discussed in the beginning, we've been very active on our member asks, but we're also very intentional in terms of making sure that they would fit into any kind of a bond measure uh, that might move forward. So we're, we're sort of going down both two tracks. Director Samuel. Um, real quick, I just wanna repeat the end of uh, your presentation, Doug, about um, the 2024 election schedule because it is a presidential election year. I think you mentioned March is most likely when the primary would be scheduled. So if there was the potential for this bond that this resources bond that we're talking about, and it, if it were to be on that primary schedule, that would be in that March election timeframe. Uh, if that gets then kind of like the schedule kind of backdated, when would that have to be formed and ready to go to make mm -hmm. it on that March ballot? Yeah, great question. Um, I believe, so director, oftentimes we have deadlines. We have hard deadlines and we have deadlines and we have soft deadlines. And I've seen these be, these deadlines be pushed a number of times. I believe though, in order to be eligible for March, it would probably be early August at the latest. And then, and then of course, the challenge associated with that, that it's great to have a bond. It's great to have a vehicle on the ballot for voter consideration, but there's the whole campaign side of it. And um, the ramp up, a six month ramp up, seven month ramp up is, is pretty challenging. The, I guess the only advantage to March over um, November would be that legislatively advanced initiatives can be on the March ballot. Citizen initiatives cannot. So you you have um, it wouldn't be so there wouldn't be so much clutter come March and it'd be more of a fo focused and targeted uh, campaign and a lot more of the energy would be around this bond because I believe there's only a couple other measures that have qualified um, through the legislature whereas come November um, I. At least four have qualified, and it's anticipated closer to 10 will likely qualify, if not 12, come November. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I believe it'd be early, early mid-August would probably be the deadline. That answers that. And then you said you, you, you would think that almost 10 for November 2024? Yeah, I just, I just was reviewing it not too long ago, and it seemed like I saw four to six. And a lot of they're out for circulation sig signature right now, and many have already uh, met the initial threshold, twenty five percent signature threshold. So it's it, it'll be there'll be um, a tidy sum for sure, not so tidy sum come November. Okay, thank you, Director Wasp. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I was wondering if you'd um, clear something up for me. I've, I've heard a number of times that. Uh, if the projections are correct, and you know we've gone from fifty million dollar um, uh, on the good side uh, of twenty five million billion dollar deficit, uh, there might be some type of makeup which would be, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of set asides that were given to us last year and some funding um, uh, certain projects, I, I'm, and and I've heard that that's maybe taken back to to uh, correct the deficit is. 
do, do you have an opinion on that? Or, I mean, uh, I've heard a number of things that, oh, no, our money's protected. I'm referring to specifically, or especially, uh, the $36 million for Point Milati. Um, oh, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is that in danger at all, do you perceive? Or, 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 I mean, do we need to upgrade that helicopter in the next week? Uh, <laughs> or, or, uh, so, at least... Point? Yeah, at least at this juncture, those direct allocations, my best knowledge, to my best knowledge and understanding, they are well protected. These were agreements um, and commitments made between the legislature, individual legislators, and the administration. And I, and, and unless things continue to spiral out of control. Um, and it's a possibility, but I, I, I can't envision a scenario where they would, um, the governor would propose in his May revise or somewhere down the road, um, a take back of those funds. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly, fairly um, certain that those are going to be protected going forward. Yeah, Dennis. It's more the programmatic dollars, like, for example, as we discussed um, there was funding in there for trails. There was funding in the budget for uh, the statewide park program. And oftentimes what they're doing is rather than spending the dollars in this year's budget, which was being proposed, they're spending it out years in hopes that um, some of the revenues uh, will start to trend more favorably. But again, member requests, as, such as the case in Point Milati, I, I think we're on pretty solid footing for sure. All right, thank you. And uh, Director Waspy, I would just reiterate that's what we're also hearing from from staff is that our our direct allocations are are protected. But I did want to add, um, and I don't I don't think we touched on it yet, is that um, in the budget uh, there's a significant reference to both the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure uh, Act that was passed at the federal level. So the, the governor is really anticipating to backfill some of the revenue uh, uh, shortfalls uh, with federal funds through those two acts. And so we um, have a, a challenge um, to monitor those fund, funds and make sure that, they're, that we're eligible um, and that they're getting allocated in such a way that um, the park district is, is can be can be a recipient in in a way that we weren't for the COVID relief funds, and so we're really um, taking a hard look at that to see how we can engage and make sure that both from however the funding gets passed down from the federal government to the state, and then how the state chooses to allocate it. We want to make sure that we're we're keeping track of that all at every step along the way. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're ready to move on to legislative program updates. We have some recommendations for supporting of uh, uh, both federal and uh, state legislation. Yeah, and I can we can move through these fairly quickly. I think um, the the first bill, the significant part of that S twenty one Community Wildfire Protection Act, the significant piece there is uh, expands the uh, eligibility list of um, communities that can engage in these kind of uh, protection plans. Um, the current list is listed in the 2001 Federal Register. And obviously, as communities grow and get closer and, and more communities get closer to the wildland urban interface, more communities are at risk. Uh, and then also with the changing climate, uh, more, more drier communities are at risk. So this expands a list of eligibility who um, for communities that could receive these grants to, to, to make proper plans for wildfire fire protection. Uh, the next bill uh, is actually most simply an effort to make sure that the local match requirement for FEMA funds for wildfire recovery uh, is flexible. Currently, it would require a 25% match for any recovery funds that are being expended. Um, and so in some cases, there may be more damage than a community could actually afford to, to uh, match with the 25%. So this just eases that ability and, and gives FEMA a little bit more leniency. 
The Wildfire Smoke, HR 481 Wildfire Smoke Relief Act is uh, of interest to the Park District in that it makes us eligible to receive funding for masks, respirators, and other smoke inhalation prevention equipment. Um, so particularly important for our employees out in the field where uh, their smoke exposure uh, can be pronounced during wildfire season. And so this would potentially provide additional resources for the district. Uh, moving on to state legislation, uh, AB 345, uh, this is really uh, an interesting concept. It allows for advanced money for habitat restoration for flood control. And that's very uh, interesting in that not only is it allowing for advanced payment, but recognizing that nature is part of the solution for uh, flood, flood control efforts. And so um, kind of exciting to see that trend. And then the last bill, which we actually would like to ask for a co-sponsorship uh, position, uh, and Doug may want to weigh in, is to basically ensure that funding that comes from the federal transportation dollars for uh, trails, uh, some of it is allocated for recreational trails. And that's important because the federal transportation bill a few years back, and Peter will remember this, was literally held up at a national level over the debate about should transportation dollars be going to recreational trail funding. And so what it what what that bill created was kind of an opt-in option for states uh, to receive rec trail money. They, they essentially had to opt in. Um, California has been, been doing so, but um, this legislation would, would more solidify that that would continue in the future. Um, and Doug, on this one, since you've worked with the author, I don't, I, do you have any other additional feedback on, on AB 411? Sure. So um, right now the sponsor is um, California Park and Rec Society. The California Trails Foundation is also weighing in as a potential sponsor. And the bottom line associated with this bill, and not to get into the weeds, but we talked about it, back in 2013, the state created the nation's first active transportation program. And in doing that, the state didn't have any money. So what they did is they cobbled together all these um, funds from existing sources. And two of those sources were, were the Environmental Enhancement Mitigation Program, because it had a trails component, and then the Rec Trails uh, program, which obviously has a recreation trails component. So combined, um, about $6 million annually is flowing away from recreation specific trails. And when people agreed to the active transportation program way back when, there was a promise that those monies would be restored to the rightful place. So what this bill is doing is basically um, asking the legislature to remind everybody of the promise that was made 10, 10 years ago and try to get money back more into what, what I call natural surface trail infrastructure in the state of California, which is the state doesn't spend a single dollar here. This again is a federal, um, the money available for these purposes comes from the feds. So that's the upshot. Thank you, Doug. Uh -huh. uh, Can we move on? I watch. Yeah, well, uh, I think at this time might be um, appropriate to ask for a support position for the previous bills. Oh, yes, of course. Um, and I was going to ask whether uh, we separate out AB 411 um, for a separate vote for co-sponsorship or if we can do that all together. And I'm actually not sure. All right, why don't I recommend that we entertain a motion to approve the recommend, recommended support position for the district on uh, legislation A listed as A, B, C, and D. Is there a motion? So moved. Director Waspi moves. I'll second. Director San Wong seconds. Please take the uh, roll of the board. We will be acting on item A, B, C, and D. Absolutely, Chair Coffey. Director Waspi. Aye. Director San Wong. Yes. And Chair Coffey. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. So now we will entertain a motion to support AB 411 with the addition of uh, supporting co sponsorship of that legislation. Is I'll, I'll make that motion. Director San Wong moves. Second. Seconded by Director Waspi. Please call the roll. 
Absolutely. Director Waspy. Aye. Director San Wong. Yes. And Chair Coffey. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Now on to watch. Sure. And these will be pretty self explanatory, I believe. The first uh, bill uh, would provide pre entry, as it says, pre entry to state parks for Gold Star family members. I believe this would impact our. Um, parking fees at uh, Del Val and Crown Beach. Um, and we have it as a watch because I'm not 100% um, certain uh, of its future in terms of uh, passing through the legislature. And I don't know if if Doug has any thoughts on that, um, but just I'll, I'll explain the thinking about AB 557. And then maybe Doug, if you have any comments on either one, um, that would be appreciated. Uh, the Brown Act relaxation bill, while we're not, it, it does not offer uh, hard relief from uh, moving back to in person, uh, but it does have a, in its, and it still requires an emergency declaration to meet, meet remotely. Uh, but it is an indication that there's a number of bills in the legislature dealing with this uh, possibility of continuing hybrid meetings, and we're continuing to watch through CSDA and League of Cities to see um, if there might be uh, a vehicle moving forward that we can put some advocacy energy behind. But Doug, I don't know if you have comments on, on either of those two. No, I, I think you summarized nicely. I'd say on the first bill, it'll be a bit of a challenge. Um, what, what we're being told by state parks, state park staff that they're not uh, equipped to um, engage in any new programming or to provide discounts unless there's a general fund backfill. And um, as, as, as noble and, and it's rightly intentions this bill is, it's probably gonna be a challenge going forward. And then on the second bill, no, Eric, I know there's a second uh, piece of legislation that's more specific to advisory groups or I'm sorry, advisory boards, such as your PAC, um, and I believe that's going to be AB 817. So we'll be monitoring these during the course of the year. Doug, do you, can you elaborate a little on uh, potential AB 817 affecting our advisory board? There, I, I don't have a lot of information, Director Coffey, other than because it's one of the, it's a spot bill right now. And I haven't seen the fleshed out language. It's in Ledge Council. I okay. Wish I, had, I wish I had more information. To be a bit pedestrian about it, I can, <laughs> and I make a suggestion that we uh, perhaps engage in, in, in that and whatever level, you know, I don't obviously know your trade very well. And it, this is particular to us. Uh, it is as follows. I have been engaged in recruiting for a vacancy on our PAC. Um, mm -hmm. One of my appointments was termed out in January. Mm -hmm. And uh, my ward is at, in part at the far reaches of the two counties. Uh, I think Olivia has the, the same issue. So to go to these folks and say, you got to come all the way to Oakland from East Contra Costa or other far reaches of the um, two counties is a deterrent uh, and a real one. And I think it's impacted our PAC for years uh, because our membership on the PAC seems to be very uh, concentrated with members historically who are fairly close to this area of Oakland, yeah, either you know, from West Contra Costa, Contra Costa, Martinez, and, um, you know, not the far reaches. So it is proven um, just the other day. I've had to have this discussion with a potential candidate about uh, that. And, you know, we still have the opportunity as we did pre-COVID to list our home addresses on the agenda if we want to uh, participate from home. And more and more people are reluctant to do that these days. Uh, so it is a big problem. And yeah. if not for, you know, relaxing it for members of the board, which I also support, uh, for uh, reasons that sometimes there are opportunities where in the past we'd just be absent and now we can actually participate by Zoom, uh, except for uh, the tightening that has taken place, uh, but especially for our advisory committees and if it could be seen fit to put uh, legislators in our shoes where 
we um, really do face a barrier to recruitment for these committees where you're in a, uh, an agency with such a large geographical jurisdiction as ours that it really matters. And uh, good, you know, whatever good government sentiments are behind these tightening of the Brown Act in terms of personal in-person uh, meetings, I, I think that has to be communicated. So I'm just uh, sharing that with you, um, Doug, uh, um, Eric's knows it. <laughs> Eric but no, knows absolutely. It. And we've, we've had this discussion, uh, Eric and I, and completely understand. Um, it's my understanding that um, this, this bill, when, when it's introduced, will be jointly sponsored by uh, Liga California Cities, um, CSDA, um, CARPD, California Association of Park Districts. I don't know where the, the CSAC is quite yet, but I think there's a growing understanding of this dynamic and the challenges associated with recruitment, particularly in the cases as, such as what you're experiencing with your ward. So um, we'll be monitoring it very closely and, and hopefully have a, have a position once, once the bill is, is fleshed out and, and we have some content to review. All right, and so if there is a need for personal testimony as to these barriers, I would be happy to participate. And I think uh, the Park District as an organization would be happy to participate because we are actually experiencing this. Um, thank you, Doug. Uh -huh, my pleasure. Uh, and, and I wanna uh, also just make a note that AB 308 is on our watch list, but I find it highly unlikely that this district would ever oppose free entry to state parks for Gold Star uh, family members, um, recognizing that maybe in Sacramento, there's some issues with it, but certainly um, there, there would, from our perspective, uh, be support for uh, Gold Star family members in the state. Uh, item B, projects and programs, winter voters oh, survey may, may update. I? And I was going too quickly. I'm sorry, Director Wasson. That's okay, because I, I, I'm, uh, AB 308, I, I, maybe it could be programmatically difficult for the state to do this, to allow Gold Star families in, or anybody for that matter, any special interest group. But geez, for us, it wouldn't be difficult at all. And, and I, we continue to say we want to be welcoming. This is a way of being welcoming. This is getting more people to come to the Park District. Uh, I think uh, I can see anything, and, and Director Rosario and I both talked about this for years, to allow a, a group like that to come in, I think does nothing to enhance our, our, our welcoming uh, uh, goals, and, uh, and programmatically, it wouldn't be tough. In fact, I mean, if you want to get real down and dirty about it, you would say, well, it's not hard programmatically. Some, we got a gate attendant. They see somebody's gold star. I guess you get it's a, a physical gold star. Yeah, it's a physical gold star. You get to come to the park. And then what do we do? Like, we let them in the front door. And then we charge them for camping. We charge them for all concessions. We, it's, it's, uh, it's just a way of doing business. And I think it's a good one of doing business. And that's also a social issue that I support. And their dogs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For future consideration. Um, now, um, item B, projects and programs. Thank you, Director Waski. Uh, winter voter survey update. Yeah, hi, uh, Eric Fieler again. Uh, very brief um, discussion because uh, the principal of the, the company that, or the consultant that issued the survey had, a family matter to attend to, and we have not had a uh, debriefing from, from them yet. So uh, the next meeting, we intend to have a more robust presentation, uh, but just from a very top level, uh, we, can, we can share that it was uh, administered through February 1st through 6th. It was uh, 500 likely voters in Alameda and Contra Costa County. The breakdown was about 55% of the respondents lived in Alameda, 45% in Contra Costa, which reflects the actual population, for, tracks it pretty well. Uh, one question we did uh, get some results on is that 78% of the respondents approve, approve of operation, the operations and maintenance uh, of the park district, uh, how, we're, how we're handling that, we're held in high regard. Um, there were a number of topics that received 70% uh, support. Um, so this would be the, the public willing to invest in. 
uh, as you can imagine, vegetation management, top of the list, uh, maintaining existing regional trails, uh, restoring ecosystems through drought tolerant and fire resistant vegetation, uh, funding for watersheds and urban creeks. And then uh, to Director Waspy's point, ensuring all visitor, visitors are welcome. Uh, but uh, the focus there was really on safe and inclusive accessible facilities. Um, so these are all uh, all supported over 70% and they're all in alignment with the park district's identified le legislative program goals. So uh, it was exciting to see. Um, and then I just wanted to comment there, the, the, the notion of maintaining existing regional trails did seem to be more important trails and parks, uh, more important to folks than um, opening up new parks. Um, we'll have more on the on the details on that as we look deeper into the cross tabs. Are but, you saying maintaining the regional trails are, is more important than new parks or extending uh, regional trails? In other words, uh, enlarging regional trails as opposed to new parks? It, it, I think the answer is actually both because the question used the words upgrading and maintaining. So would okay, you prefer to upgrade? Both. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, just as a reflection of some of the demographics, it, it did appear that this particular firm's Tulchin Research, I forgot to mention that, uh, did uh, sample a slightly more moderate uh, uh, group of voters. Um, and that was, you know, of interest. And then I just wanted to highlight when this survey was um, administered uh, literally was the, the same day, started the same day that the interest rates went up another quarter point. Uh, the war in Ukraine had just been begun and uh, the state budget had been just announced with the um, the governor stating there, there was a, indeed a def, uh, deficit. So take that into account when, when thinking about how people were answering um, in terms of spending resources on parks. Um, so we do expect to learn more uh, from from uh, Ben Tulchin and his firm um, as he returns from his um, as he as he returns. So uh, we should have a more thorough, detailed, and breakdown from them um, for our next for our next meeting. I'm sorry. Tell me the dates of the survey again. February first through sixth this year. Yeah. All right. So the word been underway for a while. Um, I look forward to that. Those are interesting trends and it also would feed into our emphasis on active transportation funding grants that we're going after to suggest that our constituents are you know, very much focused on uh, enhancing their ability to use regional trails for all sorts of purposes recreational and commute and it shows in our surveys so that that's um, a good point to support those pursuits of these trails any questions, Director Samuel? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, what was the estimated cost for this pro the survey? Estimated what? Cost, cost cost to field the survey. The survey was fielded for fifty thousand dollars. And 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 how often do we typically field these surveys? And do we have plans again, maybe next February of 2024? Twice a year we field the survey. It's in our work plan. So we do one community survey, which is weighted to the demographics of the East Bay as a whole, and one voter survey annually, which is weighted to likely voters. Okay. And this, it, this was the voter. This was the voter survey. Okay. And we do it two times a year, you said? Correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. One is scientific, Olivia, and one is uh, outreach to an intended audience. Dr. Wasco? Okay, you got my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, site visits, meetings, item C. Uh, well, we, we thoroughly discussed the uh, advocacy days, but we yes, did want to acknowledge them as, a, uh, as uh, a site visit and meetings. Um, and then uh, just quickly, I'll give an update uh, on February 9th, uh, supervised, well, actually it was um, the Watershed Project held a site visit uh, Wildcat Creek Trail uh, near Verde Elementary in Richmond, and Supervisor Joya was in attendance, and they invited park districts, so a couple of our, our field staff and myself attended, um, and the, the, the real issue is a, a fish ladder is being repaired. Uh, which is great, 
and that's a county flood control project. Uh, but as they're doing that work, they're looking at potentially improving the overall site, um, which includes the trail. So we wanted to make sure we were we were there to hear what people were saying, and uh, we'll continue to engage with that group to make sure that uh, we were more involved in that planning process than we had been heretofore. Uh, and then the last um, site visit uh, to speak to, uh, I don't know, Thor, if you might want to may maybe make a brief comment on it, but we are going to be awarding the Radke Advocacy, Ch Advocacy Championing Advocacy Award uh, to Rebecca Bauer-Kahan uh, coming up fairly, fairly soon, I believe. That is correct. A week from today, the Park District will present this award to this very deserving award winner. Uh, it will take place at Inspiration Point at Tilden Regional Park next Friday. Uh, a big thank you to the assembly member staff for coordinating on this award ceremony and photo op. And a thank you to public affairs staff in the park district as well for working on this should be a great, uh, a great award ceremony and chance to celebrate the assembly member and her partnership. And thank you for perseverance in pursuing <laughs> this opportunity. All in follow up, yes. With the uh, assembly member. Thank you. We will move on to other matters. Eric, Lana? Not to have anything else, Director Bowman. Okay, then that uh, brings us to our last item open form public comment. Items not on the agenda. Kelly. All right. Thank you. Um, so, as uh, a lot of people know, uh, Supervisor uh, Baye uh, passed away uh, two weeks ago, and uh, um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the uh, power that that uh, seat has. For example, um, I'll give you a, a, a example close to home. Uh, the reason that the main entrance to Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park is closed today is because the road is collapsed, and that road is collapsed because of the Public Works Agency, which is under the control of the Board of Supervisors. So, uh, they, and there's a lot of other roads that are collapsed that are uh, that are closed too, all over the place, and that uh, that is uh, mainly it's encircling mainly encircles Castro Valley, literally encircles Castro Valley. These road road closures. Um, but uh, uh, as the, uh, the memorial service is tomorrow and a great chance for politicking as usual, and uh, the, the, the replacement for the seat will be uh, appointed and, and uh, you'd have to say, well, you know, uh, we don't, we all the members of this board, uh, if we're going to talk about who replaces Feinstein, you know, uh, the, uh, the members of this board of directors, none of them live in Hayward or Union City or Fremont. That's what half a million people. So there's zero representation in the in in the in the tri cities. But uh, uh, it turns out that uh, last time around, when they replaced uh, Wilma Chan, that that didn't matter. That they just brought in somebody from uh, and and uh, they they didn't uh, have residency, but they established residency three days before being appointed. So I think that that op really opens up this seat. It, uh, I'm very, very excited. I think we have a whole, uh, we've got candidates everywhere in the state based on the, uh, the, the uh, precedent that was set right here in late 2021 with the appointment of Supervisor uh, Dave Brown. We now have everybody, this is open season, everybody can apply. I think that there's a, a great, great chance. I, one of my candidates, I was thinking of Doug Emhoff. He's the uh, uh, husband of, uh, of, of is our vice president. And he is, is a tremendous political character and he's been knows everybody in the Bay Area. He would do a wonderful job as supervisor of Alameda County. I think we should consider him. Thanks. All right, Kelly, thank you for that Alameda County update. We will mix, next go to articles and social media. Any comments or questions? Looked interesting as always. All right. Uh, with that, any closing board comments? I don't have any. Kowalski does. Just, yeah, um, so Peter or, or, or Eric. So what's the timing? And, and Peter alerted me to this or reminded me of this when he spoke 
so the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which we've talked about every minute that I've been there, every time we go there, and we, we I've been there a number of times. And what's the timing of it? Because I, I, as I understand, do I understand correctly? It was it was always the law was there, the money was there, then it was never spent. It was always taken away from us. But then recently, it was uh, so that it had to be funded fully. And do I understand correctly? It had to be appropriated also. So what's the timing of that? I mean, California obviously would get a big, big bunch of that, and, and we would probably get a little bit of bunch of that. I, I'm wondering, what, what's the timing of that being appropriated? Uh, or is it the, short, the short answer, Director Rossby, is spring and decisions in the fall. So money, there's two buckets. There's the federal side that goes to the federal agencies, and then there's the state side that goes money that comes from the federal coffers and goes to the state. And so that you apply for in the first half of the year usually is decided in the latter half late in the year. So I don't know if that helps you in terms of timing, usually spring slash summer application and then decision within Hopefully in the in the calendar year, sometimes it carries over into the next year. Sometimes it's faster than 12 months, but um, the money is approved. The money is distributed on an annual basis. It goes to the states. The states decide how they want to spend their money. And, and just in, uh, Lisa, if you want to go ahead, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just be real quick. So this round of application for 2023 um, is due on June 1st. And our grants manager, Katie Hornbeck and Jeff, I see you're still on here, um, is working on an application for our Oyster Bay project, the one that's drawn the attention of Assemblymember Ortega. It's a great fit. Um, and then we also are working with the Land and Water Conservation Fund to secure funding for Keller Beach for access improvements out in Richmond. Thank you. And, and to um, Director Waspy's point, yes, California. So it's sub-allocated once it's um, allocated to California. And a sizable portion of that is available uh, for local assistance grants. And California is subject to receive somewhere in the order of 23 to $24 million annually going forward. So it's pretty, it's, it's very substantial. Thank you, Director, Director Samuel. Closing. Yeah. Nothing. I just wanted to, before adjourning, thank uh, Peter and Doug for uh, staying with us throughout the meeting. And uh, the availability is is, is always uh, welcome and appreciated. And to Flora and uh, Lisa and Eric for all the work you put into preparing for this session. And uh, to staff and all of those uh, working to logistically pull this off. We all very much appreciate it. Uh, with that, seeing no other comments, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.